Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. Today we're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance for one of their celebrity lectures. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. To all who are regular attendees of our celebrity lecture series, you know that we have been privileged to have some truly prominent individuals sharing their experiences, knowledge, and insights into the many aspects of our nation's aerospace achievements. Today, we are especially privileged to have for our speaker an equally prominent individual bringing us equally valuable experience, knowledge, and insights. But in addition, today's prominent individual happens to be one of our own. Mike Simonera has been and continues to be one of our institution's staunchest supporters and most valuable advisor and counselor. He also brings decades of experience in a wide variety of aerospace achievements and a whole catalog of personal achievements in our industry. Ladies and gentlemen, I turn the podium over to Mike Simonera. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see so many young faces out there and many, many dear friends. Thank you all for coming. I'm going to tell you this morning about the aircraft designers. This is a book that I've been working on for uh, oh, approximately four years. And during this period of time, I've had the privilege of interviewing people uh, throughout the country in order to prepare the book. There were about 80 people involved. The purpose of the book is to remember not only the aircraft designers, but also the people, the teammates who actually created the aircraft during its concept definition phase up through actually contract award. Now, there are a lot of gray areas because, as you'll find out, many things had to be developed after we got the contract. Many of you have been through that. And we took Grumman first. There are a series of companies that I'm working on, and I wanted to thank my wife, Irv Walland, and Dr. Brian Hunt, who's in the audience here, uh, for giving me some sage advice by saying, look, just take one company at a time. It turned out to be a rather large task to get it done. And we're going to be talking about aircraft, the derivatives of the aircraft, demonstrating aircraft, and also some advanced designs to give you a concept of what the aircraft design process was through the eyes of the teammates. Now, what's happened in most aircraft companies, there was a transition from being an aircraft builder to a major weapon system developer. That's what happened to Grumman, and we're going to be talking about that. Just to summarize briefly, many of you have heard about the great aircraft designers like Andre Tupolev or Jack Northrop or Leroy Grumman or Donald Douglas. What I'm attempting to do here is to tell you about not only the aircraft designers, but the people, the teammates who actually created the aircraft. Now, the contents of the book are shown in this particular chart. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. There are 10 chapters, but what's very important in the book is to look down and you begin to see things called the lineage of battlefield surveillance, the lineage of airborne early warning, the lineage of electronic warfare. This is where Grumman gravitated to, and this is why the story is told in this regard. There are some 175 photographs in the book. I'm not going to show you all of them, but I will tell you that in the book is something very unique that each person gets in the book. It's this beautiful fold-out on high-quality paper of every major aircraft that Grumman actually produced. And uh, this has never been published before uh, in this particular form. So let's begin the story about Grumman. Let's start with Leroy Grumman. Some of you see the F4F Wildcat out there, and I'm going to touch on that just a little bit about it. But Leroy Grumman, shown on the left portion of the chart, graduated from Cornell in 1916. And he was very interested in boats and the sea. He wanted to become a submariner. Now, it turns out after he graduated, he went ahead and he went to MIT and he took a naval aviation introductory physical. And he passed it, but he failed the eye exam. How about that? And nobody reported it. So he became naval aviator 1216 and he actually test flew Grumman aircraft all through World War II. Now, on the right, you see another gentleman just to the left of Leroy Grumman with a cigarette. That's Grover Loning. Now, Grover Loning was the, was the assistant to Wilbur Wright. 
and he was the chief aeronautical engineer of the Army Signal Corps during World War I. And he formed his first company, Loaning Aircraft, in 1917. A brilliant designer. He de developed some interesting aircraft. But what was even more important is that he hired the core and the nucleus of engineers that eventually became the Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation. Very interesting story. Now, one of the key people in this particular scenario is Bill Schwindler, shown on the left. That's his first design, an amphibian that he designed, and Leroy Grumman signed it. But what's very interesting about the man is that he was very conservative, and I'll tell you about his design philosophy on the next slide. But what they started out doing when Grumman was formed in 1929-1930, they started to build floats. These were monocoque construction floats. That means the outer shell takes all the loads, and they developed an idea to retract the gear into the float. The Navy was very nervous about this. They felt it might come apart. So guess what? Leroy Grumman and Jake Swerble, another key guy that was hired by Grover Loaning, he actually became president of the company and ran the production, they jumped in the, the Vought uh, scout plane, catapulted from the battleship, and proved to the Navy that it would work. Now we go on to another interesting gentleman by the name of Julie Holpit. He's shown on the right. He was not an engineer. He was the first head of Grumman's prototype shop. Uh, he, he was the first of a long line of very distinguished people who could work with the engineers and assemble the first airplane. Now on the left, you see some words about the FF-1 that used a retractable landing gear, very much like the F-4F out here. It was heavier, but the airplane was 20 miles an hour faster. And the F-3F, which was a descendant of it, was a remarkable airplane for the Navy. Again, it was a biplane and what have you. But Julie Hopet had some very interesting stories as I read about his letters and going through the archives. In those days, when he came to, to Grumman, he brought his sewing machine and tin snips. That's the way they built airplanes then. And one of the test pilots, Jimmy Collins, dove the airplane and pulled 12 and a half Gs. The airplane came apart and this was in the middle of a development contract. So Julie said, you know, we've got a little bit of time left. He turned around to Mr. Grumman, and Mr. Grumman said, what? And the Navy said, what? And he said, I can rebuild the airplane. So they rebuilt a complete airplane in 21 days, test flew it. They got the contract for 54 more aircraft. And Julie was the first in the long line and probably our first field service representative. OK, now we're going to talk about design philosophies. Now, this is very important. I'm not going to dwell too long on this, but on the upper portion of the chart, you see Mr. Grumman, who's shown on the left. The cockpit will be the last to fail. In other words, I don't care what you do with the airplane, I'm going to protect the pilot. And you can see an F-6F coming apart on the right side of the screen, landing on a carrier in World War II. It disintegrated, but the pilot walked away. Now, Mr. Schwindler, had something called a structural load factor of two. I see Harvey Eidenhoff over there, and he knows all about that. He was a major contributor to the book. And Mr. Schwindler said, I will judiciously apply a factor of two to any designed item that I feel that is important that meets spec so I can maintain the structural integrity of the aircraft. And that's what he did. And that's what he inculcated in every single Grumman engineer that worked in structures, believe me. And on the left here, you see the skewed wing axis of the F4F Wildcat out there. Well, that was invented by Leroy Grumman using a gum eraser and paper clips and figuring out how to reduce the wingspan, because he reduced the span from 38 feet to roughly 14 and a third feet. And that changed the whole spotting factor on the carrier. OK, now we're going to go through all the Grumman aircraft in World War II, and we're going to go to the last one called the AF-2S, AF-2W. And uh, the reason why I bring that one out is the fact that it was designed by a gentleman by the name of Art Koch. He was known as the lightning fast configuration layout guy, very much like Dan Ryan over here, who's chief of design of, of Northrop aircraft. Very fast and very, very quick. I mean that sincerely. And he laid out this airplane, and what's interesting about it, it was a hunter-killer design. And you can see the large rotodome on the bottom of the, of the forward aircraft. 
Well, in those days, the Navy dictated all the equipment that we were to use. It was government furnished equipment. So our avionics people did basically RFI work, radio frequency interference work. They made it work and sold the airplane. But in 1945, on the lower portion of the chart, Oscar Olson, who was head of the avionics group, a very small excellent group, said, you know, we have to form a system engineering group. Now imagine that in 1945, when he recognized that eventually Grumman would take over more and more of the responsibility. And that's how we got started. Now we go into a very interesting design that I'm jumping through here, and this is called the XF-10F Jaguar. I'm sure many of you might have heard about it. It was the Navy's first variable sweep wing. Now you have to understand what was going on at Grumman and in the Navy at the, at the, in the after years wars in the late 40s, early 50s. The Navy was pushing more and more payload into the aircraft. The aircraft were getting heavier. They were getting larger. They wanted more range. And guess what happened? The approach speed was going up and they had a problem. Grumman initially proposed the Jaguar as a fixed wing design, but then they eventually came around and said, I'm gonna make it a translating variable sweep design. I'm not gonna get into all of that, but I will tell you that that worked very well. And uh, it showed, compared with the F3H Demon, that they could tremendously reduce the approach speed by 30 to 40% and increase the cruise range by 40 to 50%. It was really remarkable, but what happened is when they designed the airplane, the designers were allowed to put a lot of new features in the aircraft. This violated Bill Schwindler's edict by saying every new airplane should have the least amount of new things on it. Well, this one had a new engine, a new wing, it was all cable controlled, and it had an all-flying T-tail which was aerodynamically balanced as opposed to being hydraulically boosted. So at very low speed, it was very difficult to control. And the designer of the aircraft, Gordon Israel, was a self-taught engineer. He flew in the Cleveland air races at the age of 21. He designed his own airplanes. The F7F Tiger Cat, the Mallard, the Panther, and the Cougar series where all the lines were all established by Israel. However, he did not trust his young physicists from MIT who were working with something called a computer. <laughs> I'm serious. And he didn't believe them. And they said, you're going to have a longitudinal oscillatory problem at very low dynamic pressure or Q. I see a lot of nods in the head here. Well, that's what happened. And they had to change the tail. And Joe, Joe Lippert, a, uh, an aerodynamic designer, a very famous one, actually built, guess what, a radio controlled model and proved the same thing. So it just shows you how we learned and how we made mistakes. Okay, now I wanna talk a little bit about preliminary design. Preliminary design was called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. These were all hand-picked people with tremendous background. They understood all the complexities of aircraft design. In 1954, there were 30 of them. In 1964, there were 300 of them. Why? Because we hired operations analysts. We were looking to the future. This was the time after World War II, the Cold War started, the Korean War was on, and there were a lot of new X airplanes. So it was a tremendous amount of work. And this is what it looked like in the 50s. Now this gentleman right here on the lower right portion of the chart, his name is Joseph Hubert. He was the chief aerodynamicist of the ME-163 in World War II, the rocket-powered interceptor. He came to Grumman, he was a very quiet man. I had the privilege of knowing him and working with him, a remarkable person, and he uh, was part of the preliminary design process. Okay, now I'm gonna pick an airplane called the A2F Intruder. This is a remarkable airplane that was designed in the 50s and 60s, and what happened here is this was an all-weather attack system. So Grumman, this was not the first job that Grumman had, but Grumman was totally responsible for the weapon system performance. They had to procure the radars. They were now company furnished equipment, integrate all the displays and make it work. And the first prototype is flying there with tilting tailpipes and there's one of the later versions and what have you. Now there's a couple of interesting anecdotes about this that I wanted to relate to you. 
The A-6 ended up being the safest airplane that the Navy operated. And everybody thought it was because it had very good low speed controllability or had good vision of the nose. That was not the reason. The reason was it had literally indestructible landing gear. And Grumman had landing gear designers who were as good as the industry. So we influenced the design and that's why it was so safe. Now there's another very interesting story. When they started putting the displays in the cockpit, they had a pilot and a bombardier navigator. And the people that were wrestling with, with this were dive bomber pilots in World War II. And one of the avionic engineers, his name was Newt Spies, he was a very visionary avionic engineer. He was listening to them and he said, I don't really understand what they're talking about. They, were, they had a vertical display and they were trying to get this pathway in the sky put on the display when the airplane rolled and changes of azimuth happened. So he said, I'm going to figure this out. So he got his pilot's license. And in the middle of winter on Long Island, and those of you who are familiar with Long Island, they had these big empty parking lots near the ocean with grids. Somebody got in a car with a camera, and he flew in the airplane and rolled the airplane and figured out how to put that pathway in the sky display on the screen. Again, it talks about the versatility of the engineers and their imagination. Now I'm going to jump to not a fighter airplane, but to something called the AGCAT. This was an agricultural spraying airplane that was designed by Joe Lippard, and the designer on the right was Art Koch. Remember, he was the lightning fast designer. He wanted to design a replacement for the, for the Goose Amphibian. He wanted to have four engines and a new wing, etc. And they couldn't get it off the ground. In other words, they were talking about it, they talked to people back and forth. So they went up to see Leroy Grumman. And Leroy Grumman said, you know, that's a good idea. Here's the money, go ahead. And that's literally how the decision was made. So this is part of the Grumman culture. There was, there was no hierarchy. If you had an idea, and I'll talk about it in the end, you could go forward and get that idea done. And that's how it started. Okay, now I talked to a nice gentleman here today who was a pilot of one of the Gulf Streams. And the story of the Gulf Stream is a remarkable story. Uh, we see the Gulf Stream 1 on the left and the Gulf Stream 2. I also talk about the Gulf Stream 3 in the book and many, many variants of it. But I want to tell you some of the stories of how the Gulf Stream started. It's very interesting. It didn't start as an executive jet trans uh, turboprop transport. It started as a passenger carrier for the United States Navy. They pressurized, they took a pressurized fuselage of a, of a uh, S2F tracker, which I didn't talk about, and they put T-55 turboprop engines on it, and they tried to get the existing gear to fit in it, and they were wrestling with it, and it didn't work out too well. Finally, the word came down from the front office. They said, let's go ahead and replace the DC-3. And they had a wonderful man by the name of Henry Schiebel, who was a pilot that helped them with this, and maybe some of the older Convair airplanes. So they set about designing the Gulf Stream 1. And they built a mock-up in four months, and it was a high-wing design. Now, Mr. Grumman, very active at the time, came back from a trip to Florida, looked at the mock-up in the prototype shop, remember I talked about that, and said, take that damn wing off the top of the airplane and put it on the bottom. It looks like a mini Forker Friendship. And that was done in four hours. Now, I'm not kidding you. It, in four hours, they moved it down, and that's how the design took place. And of course, and of course the G2 is a marvelous airplane as well. There are many stories about that. They're in the book, but we'll move to the next chart. Okay, now we're getting involved in uh, what I call the lineage of airborne early warning. Now here you see on the lower right a very strange looking airplane. This was an S2F tracker, which was an ASW airplane, which was converted into the Navy's first airborne early warning aircraft. Now look at the size of the rotodome in relation to the size of the fuselage. That was a major aerodynamic and structural design problem that had to be solved and created in preliminary design. But, and that was done by Bill Rathke and there are two avionic engineers and the guy on the right is head of the prototype shop. Okay, so the big thing about this program, and I'm not going to tell you about its performance and what it did, this was the first big systems integration job that Grumman did. So we began to hire the best and the brightest from all the avionic 
companies. I know Paul Kennard is in here. And Paul, if you were back then, they, we probably would have hired you. But be that as it may, we started to bring on people in the avionics background. In fact, one of the gentlemen that was brought on board uh, who was there from Grumman, Mr. Schwindler, uh, Mr. Swerble thought he was hired. He said, you know, we should hire a guy like that. He's really smart on avionics. Well, fortunately, he was, he was there. But that's how Grumman really started to get into the game. Next chart. Now, the next version of this was the so-called E2A, the Hawkeye which became the E2B, the E2C, and under Northrop Grumman today, the E2D will be in production for the next 10 to 15 years, the advanced version. It's quite a remarkable airplane. But in those days, it was originally designed with two tails, and since the propellers swung in the same direction, they had a slipstream effect, they needed more area on the vertical tails, so they pr proposed a third tail, and the Navy said, I don't like that, I want things symmetrical, that's why it ended up with, with four tails. But the main thing I want to tell you about are some of the stories related to the design of the, of the E-2. And one of them is, uh, relates to the, one of the key antenna design engineers who wrote a poem. Now, how many of you are familiar with Rudyard Kipling? I'm sure you are. And you remember the story of Gunga Din, 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 right? Well, think of the thing, Dome, Dome, Dome. And this is, a, an, a, this is an excerpt from a poem which is called The Ode to an Involute Egg. Now in Grumman's sunny climb, where I used to spend my time, a serving up antennas for a fee, of all the lousy planes, on which I racked my brains, there was none could top design 123. That was the E2A. <laughs> it was dome, dome, dome. You heavy, yagi, tilted rotodome. Put another DB in it, or I'll cancel you this minute, you cockeyed, rotten, egg-shaped rotodome. <laughs> now, that's, that's kind of funny, but the point I'm trying to make is the gentleman, Jim McManus, who worked on this, he, was an, he actually designed the Rotodome to a great degree, along with many other people, and worked with the electronic houses to bring it together. It was not that, okay, give us a Rotodome. Grumman was deeply involved in the design of the electronics, and this is one of the great strengths of the company. Now, another anecdote I want to tell you about, and there are many of them, is the testing, the original test flights on the E-2A. Imagine flying from the tip of Long Island in the middle of winter. You now, you fly out into the North Atlantic in the winter, it's pretty rough. And that's where they had to test the airplane. That's where the Navy wanted to test it. So they were up at 30,000 feet, and the Navy said, can you, can you go to sea level? We, we wanted to see how you could detect submarines at sea level. So Tom Attridge brought the airplane down to between 30 and 50 feet. That's still conjectural, but he was pretty low. And the spray from the ocean was coming up on the windshield, and some of it was freezing, and they couldn't clear the windshield. So Tom Attridge got up on the escape seat, opened the hatch, and cleared the windshield while they were flying between 30 and 50 feet to finish the mission. That's just a little anecdote and tells you what our pilots were like. Now we're going to get into the lineage of the F-14, starting with the TFX, the so-called F-111B. How many remember Mr. McNamara? I'm sure you do. There was a program called the TFX, a remarkable idea. This had a pivoting variable sweep wing that was developed by John Stack at NASA, and uh, it was a remarkable penetrating bomber aircraft. It was the A and the B version for the Navy. Grumman worked on this with General Dynamics. We won the proposal. It was led by Leonard Sullivan, who went on to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Programs Analysis and Evaluation. He's 88, and I just talked to him a week ago. So he says hello to all those people. And uh, that's a picture of the F-111B and some of the issues relating to the design, the, the position of the pivot, uh, the uh, minimal transonic drag, fan engine, engine compatibility. All those requirements are all in the book. So if you read about them in a qualitative sense, you'll see what they were wrestling with. But one of the things that they were wrestling with was how do we get the landing gear into the fuselage. You think that's pretty simple, but not when you have an airplane that has an escape module, has a Phoenix weapons bay internally, and has the wing not on top of the fuselage, but cutting the fuselage. How do you get 
a landing gear into a Mach 1.2 airplane on the deck with minimal frontal area. Well, they couldn't figure it out. So the Grumman landing gear designers and the GD landing gear designers got together and they racked their brains and they found a solution by looking at the Ford Motor Company front wheel suspension. They called it the Fomoco gear and that's how it came about. Now there's another interesting story and this has to do with the positioning of the horizontal stabilizer on the vertical fin. General Dynamics chief engineer wanted to raise it up to a mid-height mid or a T-tail uh, to improve stability and was worried about drag and things like that. And Irv Walland, who was the aerodynamicist for ground at the time, says, you can't do that. That will be fatal to the Navy. The room was totally quiet. Nobody said a word because the GD engineers didn't operate that way. They had to write a memo which went to the next person and the next person and it would come down and finally they'd get a decision. So at the end of the meeting, Irv Wallen's going back with Mr. Hutton and Mr. Schwindler in the car driving back to the airport and see, gee, I hope I didn't get people mad. They said, hell no, that's what we pay you to do. Speak up. And that's the way things work. Now I want to talk just a little bit about the F-14. Uh, in my previous lecture to you, I gave you an extensive briefing on how the F-14 was conceived, and it's all in the book, by the way. But I just want to point out something to you. On the lower left, there are three generations of designers which worked on the airplane. Mike Pelahack, my boss, he was the chief designer. Dick Hutton came on board in 1932. Bill Schwindler, right there, was a founder in 1929. And over on the right, Larry Mead came in 41, and Bob Kress came in 47. Five generations of designers. One of the things that happened in Grumman was the longevity. Mr. Schwindler worked on every single design until he decided to retire, and the good Lord took him home. But the point is, that's the way we did it. That's the way we did it. We brought the young people up, but the old guys were still there, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the F-14 materials, uh, and titanium and materials development. Now, remember, I was talking about the chief aircraft designer and his teammates. Now, with time, I talked about avionics people and software people, but without this titanium development team, Grumman would not have won the F-14 program. Without the use of extensive amounts of titanium, roughly 25% of the airframe weight, the F-14 would not have been able to maintain its weight empty, which was very critical for the fighter and air combat maneuvering performance that it enjoyed. So Mr. Hedrick, who came to the company in 1941 and was one of the deans of structural design in the, in the United States, led this effort along with many, many people. Harvey Eidenhoff was one of them, and I'm sure there may be some other people. I hope I didn't leave them out. But they basically had to develop the technology of using 6AL4V titanium because the Blackbird program, which used titanium, a different alloy, was indeed black. We couldn't access it. So Grumman had to do all of this work and design and build a wing box and convince the Navy that we could electron beam weld it rather than bolt it because the Navy wanted things bolted, right? They also had a big argument about the wing skins attaching to the wing root structure at times they wanted that bolted. We convinced them we could do it in electron beam welding. But there were other things. What about damage tolerance? What about voids in the structure? All of this had to be worked out prior to award in 1969 in order for us to win the program. So many, many kudos to the people who did this work because without that, we would, we would not have won the F-14. Okay, now we're moving on to future systems. And about 1976, the company decided to bring all of the assets in the company together to pursue new business. And that was headed up by Mike Pelahack in the lower left. And the guy to his right is me, I had hair then, and uh, I, I, at that point, I took over preliminary design. And there were many other people involved. But on the right, we started working on many, many programs. Now, I can't tell you about all of them, because, but they're all in the book, as I keep saying over again. But I will touch on a few. And as you can see, we were working on a conformal radar that fit within the geometry of the aircraft. No more rotodomes. It would fit within the wing. And we, we then envisioned working on that on various aircraft. 
We worked on an advanced radar jammer with the EA-6B program. I'll tell you about that. We developed the X-29, the forward swept wing, which I'll tell you a little bit about, and a new VSTOL airplane for the Navy. So we mounted many, many design teams. But what was happening now as we were going into the 80s, guess what? There were fewer and fewer new starts. So how do you keep the young people energized? How do you get them to build hardware and test it? It's one thing to use a computer and the software, but you have to design it, build it, and test it, and break it, and make it work. And that was something that Grumman wrestled with, which I'll tell you about. So with that in mind, let's move to the forward swept wing. Now the forward swept wing was not the X-29. It started in 1976, and we won the contract in 81. At that time, it was called the FSW, the forward swept wing. And guess what? On the upper portion, we built a radio-controlled model, right? I had to go to the boss. I asked for $4,000 to build that model. And one of the young aerodynamic engineers on the lower left took it into the wind tunnel. Now, it wasn't unstable then, but we wanted to see how it flew with canards. Right? So we tested it. And the other thing that happened is we won a contract with DARPA to build a half-scale model of the actual design of the wing laying up composite materials to, devo to able to predict the aerolastic divergence that could occur at certain speeds with a forward swept wing. In addition to that, to prove to the Navy for $100,000 at that time, which was big money, we actually built a full-scale model a full-scale wing root structure. The wing skins were this thick and they had over a hundred ply on the upper surface and the lower surface. That DARPA didn't believe that we could build that. We did. We showed them we could avoid the voids and we tested it under load and we won the contract. Okay, VSTOL A, again headed up by Bob Crest. Now the, the Navy at one point was going all VSTOL. They were going to have a subsonic VSTOL for uh, search and rescue and for airborne early warning and supersonic VSTOL. Well, that got, that got put aside because of lack of funds. But what happened is that Grumman mounted really a ferocious design effort on this. And we built a full-scale powered wind tunnel model, model, tested at NASA Dryden, and it worked very, very well. We again built on the lower right a radio-controlled transition model at the end of a long boom flown in one of our large assembly hangars, and we proved that we could control the airplane. Had that program gone forward, there's no question in my mind and many others that Grumman probably would have built this, this demonstrator aircraft. Okay, now we're moving into the lineage of battlefield surveillance. Now I'm jumping across many, air, many other aircraft here for the sake of time, and I want to tell you a little bit about this. Now what you see in this particular chart, that gentleman in the l uh, right of center is Jerry McNiff. The name doesn't mean anything, but he was a brilliant avionic engineer. On the lower right is an advanced radar called the Radar Guided Weapon System, and on the lower right is the so-called Pave Mover Program, which we competed against Hughes for, where we actually did battlefield surveillance and were able to direct weapons onto a long-range target. So let me tell you how this happened. It's very interesting. In early spring of 74, the Israeli military representatives, I'm excerpting, visited Grumman with lessons learned from the Yom Kippur War in 73. Their losses were extremely high and they were inquiring whether U.S. airborne systems had the capability to accurately detect and destroy first-line defenses with precision at long ranges. How about that for a challenge? Well, Grumman, listen to that. Again, Grant Hedrick and Newt Spies, two people I mentioned, because Grant was the chief engineer at the time, said, you know, we'll look at that. So a young engineer by the name of Jerry McNiff came back with three pieces of quadrule paper. You know what quadrule paper, the engineers, you know what that is. That laid out, in quote, the relative azimuth angle target detection and weapon delivery system utilizing real-time synthetic aperture radar imagery for accurate target identification and location. Paul, you can translate that for everybody. Paul Kennard was the vice president of advanced development for Hughes. He knows all about that. But that's what we, the challenge was. So Grumman invested $40 million working with Norden, and they developed this radar. 
with an interferometer and advanced radar. Shown on the, on the left, we tested that in an old F-14. It worked very well. And that went on through DARPA to become the Pave Mover program, where we successfully demonstrated, along with Hughes, the ability to detect targets and destroy them at long ranges. And out of that came the Joint Stars, which I will tell you about. Now, I'm going to tell you a very interesting anecdote about this. The gentleman on the far right, Al Gerkowitz, was the project engineer. Again, not an aircraft designer, an avionic engineer. And he had this group of guys working seven days a week out on the end of Long Island, uh, working on the software, developing the radar. And Norton was across the Long Island Sound in Connecticut. And they were communicating back and forth. Well, there was a railroad track running alongside of the plant where they were working. And there was, used to be a toilet sitting right next to the track. So Al used to call his guys the movers uh, from Pave Mover, just to inspire them, because they were working seven days a week. So one day, he had the idea to put on a raincoat, sunglasses, a fedora hat with his newspaper. He went out and sat on the toilet as the Long Island Railroad came by. Well, you can imagine 200 people doing a double take. But again, this is all, this is an anecdote, but it's a way we just kept people active. We kept them going. There's a million stories like this that I'm sure all of you can tell. Now let's talk about Joint Stars. This is a remarkable airplane. There are 17 of them defending the United States of America today. They fly all over the world. They can literally see a metal-sided camel or a person from several hundred kilometers away in the worst weather at night and detect them. That's what was developed here, called Joint Stars. Now, stars means surveillance target attack radar system. Joint means Army and Navy working together. That's a Boeing 707-320C, which Grumman took over and modified all new wiring, a whole new system, put it all together. And the two gentlemen on the upper right, Albert Arosa and Marty Dandridge, are not aircraft designers. They're program managers with, with a great technical background. Their challenge was two things. One, after the Pave Mover program, there was a long delay, several years. So a lot of people didn't want to go to Florida. So where are we going to get these people, right? That was a big thing. And, and then they had to entice the people to come down and start the program. Now, the challenge of the program was very, very severe because the Joint Stars was an unprecedented system in the, in the eyes of the National Research Council, meaning that the protocols in the Department of Defense were not sufficient to allow the software to be developed on time, the airplane would sit on the ground too long, and the program was in jeopardy. So Marty Dandridge went ahead and talked to that gentleman in the center, Dr. Dale Burton, who came from Hughes Aircraft, we hired, and they used something called early engineering flight test software. They wrapped it around the radar to show the Air Force, get the airplane up in the air, and show the Air Force that radar would work in its basic modes. And then the war started. And guess what? They deployed the aircraft to the war. It worked very well. They came back and redesigned the system with the Air Force leadership. By the way, they were Air Force was very pivotal in this and hence came the EHC. And those airplanes today, ladies and gentlemen, are defending the United States. Now we move on to the lineage of electronic warfare. I only have one chart on this. I'm going to repeat one later. In the upper portion, you see the EA-6A, and the lower portion, you see the EA-6B. The EA EA-6A looks a lot like the A-6 Intruder. In fact, it was. It just had a 54-inch extension with some basic uh, jammer pods, they were older technology, and they were escorting our bombers as we went into North Vietnam. They reduced losses. But the Navy said, you know, uh, this is not going to be good enough. So what happened, and by the way, the EA-6A was designed by the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps. They spearheaded it, and we jumped on and did this. On the EA-6B, this was an all-new airplane from the ground up. It may look like an A-6, but it's a totally new airplane, a very fine airframe. So there was a chief aircraft designer. But how it came about was remarkable. Remember I told you about the operations analysis department and as we expanded preliminary design? Well, there was a young engineer in there who was looking at advanced uh, electronic warfare systems. And he was working with another gentleman by the name of Bob Salzman, whose name is up there on the lower left. 
and he was a brilliant engineer who came from another company, and they put together this concept called the EA Bolegs. And they said, you know, this thing is really going to work if we work with some other contractors. So uh, they took it up to the president of the company. Again, open door through business development. And he said, you know, this is a good idea. Let's try it on the Navy. The Navy loved the idea. We got a study contract. And then we got the development contract, hence the EA-6B. And that's how it came about. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more about electronic warfare later. I'm not going to go into the design of it. Again, that's described in the book in reasonable detail in a qualitative sense. But again, it's all part of the culture of how things develop. Now we're, now we're near the final chapter. Are you still with me? OK. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, wrapping up what I basically said. And I'm going to show you this chart. Now, if you look at this chart very carefully, that's the number of aircraft on the vertical axis and on the horizontal axis are decades beginning in 1930. So you have the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. And look at the number of aircraft and derivatives built at that time and look how it just nosedived. Every single major company in the United States faced this issue. So I go back to the fundamental issue is how do you keep young people stimulated? How do they build hardware? Because if you miss a generation, then you have to start over again. This is a foundational and critical issue in the United States of America today, which I was at a conference in Washington on that a few weeks ago, and that was a big issue. So what did Grumman do about this? Well, we mounted ferocious design teams. Remember I told you about v Stoll a We worked on the advanced attack aircraft, the A-12, for four years. We had 500 people working with Northrop to win that program. We didn't, we didn't win it. But we tried very, very hard. We worked on the advanced tactical fighter. Many, many attempts were made. But one of the things that happened was the X-29A, a remarkable research airplane. It did not go into production, but it operated flawlessly for over 400 flights. Never was put down. It had a very advanced digital flight control system. It was 35% unstable. In other words, if the computers quit, it would flutter out of the air like a like a leaf, and it also had very advanced composites. So we trained a design team, and these people, many of them, went to work on the ATA with Northrop. Grumman made a mistake in 1973 by not getting involved in stealth on the ground up. We started in 81. We missed three generations, so we could not be prime on the ATA for the Navy, but we were a major subcontractor with Northrop, and we worked very well together as, as, as a team. But it just shows you what, what we try to struggle with. Now we're getting near the end now. I want to tell you a little bit about the avionicers and the software. This is a word chart, and I've talked a lot about this. But one of the key things is to remember that I spent a lot of time touching on these mission areas. We became a major developer and integrator of weapon systems. We were no longer just aircraft designers. Aircraft design was critically important, but the weapon system, the integration and testing of that, was crucial. And from the 50s, we hired the best and the brightest from the industry. We built up that. We actually took over the generation of all the software on the EA-6B. We took it away from the subcontracts, and we controlled the entire software on the airplane. That's tremendous uh, value added in that. So again, on the bottom, the aircraft designer and his teammates now included avionics, software, and major subsystems. Now I want to jump ahead and tell you a little bit about the uh, EF-111. Now I'm not going to talk about its capability. This was another very advanced electronic warfare aircraft, a two-place airplane that we built for the United States Air Force very successfully. But what I want to show you on the lower right is the same airplane in the world's largest anechoic chamber in the world at that time. We could take an E-2, an F-14, or an EA-6B and suspend it and operate it at full power 24 hours a day in total security. Now imagine integrating and operating that with a systems integration test stand, which replicates the cockpit with pilots in the loop, and in the case of electronic warfare, an electronic warfare test range that simulates Soviet radars. That's, how, that's what systems integration is really all about. And this is an example of it. 
And by doing it this way, we saved roughly two to three years of flight test development time, which as many of you know, is extremely expensive. And that was just typical, again, of what was necessary, even in the creation of the aircraft. So how do you describe the designers? What is the role of the designer today? Well, I've tried to tell you that it hasn't changed too much in terms of the conceptual nature and, and, the, and the chief designer being familiar with many, many areas. But it's become much more complicated because the requirements are more demanding. There are many more skills required in avionics, software, uh, campaign analysis, uh, life cycle costing. Many, many issues are involved in the creation of the aircraft. But what is shown in this chart is what were some of the traits of these people. You can talk about leadership, creativity, curiosity, innovation. The names are not important. If you go to Lockheed or you go to, or you go to Boeing, you'll, 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 you can put different names in there. there. Another key word is versatility. Many of the chief designers worked in space and then came to aircraft, went back to space. Some worked on missiles and came into aircraft. Just an amazing time. And then we get all the way down to longevity. And I talked to you a little bit about the fact that many of the designers of Grumman were there forever. And they held design reviews. Harvey, uh, you'll remember this. Every two weeks, you'd go to Mr. Hedrick's office and you'd discuss an aspect of the design of the F-14. They wouldn't say much. They'd, they would know the subject very well and you had to be prepared. And they would never criticize you. They would say, please look at this, or I don't think that's right but please do this. And if you got a smile when you came back, you knew you were on the right track. Believe me, I went through this, and that's, that's the way it was. So I get to the last chart now, and I talk about Grumman's unique culture. What enabled the designers to come up with these ideas? I only touched on them. I only showed you 30 charts. What enabled them to do this? Well, here it is, direct access by the management. Now, a lot of companies do this today, not only Grumman, but it's key to success. We were free to express our ideas. Remember I told you about the AGCAT and the EA Bowlegs. Criticism was constructive, never demeaning. That's a very important point. We never put a person down. We wanted the person to grow. Grumman enjoyed the ideas of brainstorming, probably more so than many companies did. It didn't work all the time, but it worked pretty much. And the last part is NAVAIR, and I'll include the Air Force as well, had excellent engineers which worked hand in glove with Grumman. They were as good as our engineers in many, in many respects, and they produced some remarkable systems. So with that in line, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read you the last paragraph of the book. And I think it touches on a number of things, and just bear with me. I hope you enjoyed reading about the hundreds of Grumman people who created over 70 aircraft in a 65-year time span. One of the great pleasures of this undertaking has been reestablishing contact and renewing old friendships with almost 80 people throughout the United States. It has been an emotional journey because many of the Grumman pioneers are no longer with us. And some of them passed on or became incapacitated during my communication with them. Memories of them and their accomplishments will sustain us now. For those who remain, you're all here, we are all a little grayer now. Many are fully retired and giving back as they can, and a few are still on the front lines. Grumman will always be part of us, and at times we will remember and reminisce about those exciting years when we accomplished so much as part of Grumman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's we got done in a re it's only 12 o'clock, so we can ask some questions. Feel free. Sir, uh, this was only about aircraft. Uh, that question, by the way, came up on Long Island when uh, I talked a lot about the aircraft, and they said you didn't mention the aircraft. What I did mention is that a lot of the people worked in space and came to aircraft, but if I did that, the book would never be finished. That's a very, very good question. Uh, would you be, yes, repeat the question. Was Grumman helped or hindered by their isolated location? Well, if you were on Long Island, 
most of our engineers came from Staten Island, the Brooklyn, Bronx, Long Island, and some came from overseas too, I have to remember saying that. And uh, we tended to stay with the company a long time. In fact, we used to say, gee, those people on the West Coast, they change jobs all the time. And I came to realize that the best and the brightest migrated in California to get the job done. I don't think we were isolated because remember what we produced. I, I, this might sound like bragging, but you know, we were the leaders in EW and AEW in the world. There were a few other companies, Boeing was pretty good, and Raytheon and, and Hughes and what have you, but Grumman was right up there, so they, I, don't think it, I don't think it hurt us. Right, this is a very important question. Bob Johnson, who was the uh, chief test pilot of the F-18 program when I was there, uh, said, you know, uh, Grumman was very close to Pax River and Washington, and literally, as I was telling one gentleman here, because I used to fly the Gulf Stream every week to Washington, it was that we were an hour away. So we were in touch with Navair all the time, and Pax River, if there was a problem, we could be down there in a matter of hours and what have you. So, so you know, we weren't really isolated. Uh, uh, we also re uh, uh, enjoyed a relationship with Republic Aviation, which was a very fine company. And in their day, in, in, in fact, many of the designers that came to work for me in preliminary design came from Republic, wonderful people. And so we had that cross-fertilization. There was another aircraft company there. Yeah, this is the XFV-12A uh, was a very innovative design that the Rockwell engineers, remember North American was bought by Rockwell, and they, it was a V-stole airplane going to be used by the Navy. And they had a very interesting thrust augmentation concept, and they built it and they actually tested it full scale and they weren't getting the augmentation. So the program did not proceed forward. It was a very innovative idea, but didn't quite make it. Uh, boy, that is an important question. How do you take a lot of, you wanna put that back up again? Could we go back to that? Uh, how do you inculcate this into a subcontractor? What do you do? Well, I'll tell you. You have to roll up your sleeves and spend money and send your people to those subcontractors. On the F-18 program, which I ran for a number of years, we had problems with our subcontractors. We basically took our engineers, uh, took it out of margin, in some cases we overdid it, and we sent people to their sites to work with them to ensure that the quality of the work was coming forward. Now, in terms of leadership, you know, leadership is something that is, is not innate. You have to learn it. And not everybody, not, a lot of people can manage, a lot of people can be great leaders. You have to inspire people. You have to walk the talk. You literally have to know every mechanic on the production line. That's what you have to do if there are defects on the line. And, and if there's a problem, they get it. They, you have to walk the talk. You can't just stay up here, as you well know. The management style, you've all been through this. You have to walk the talk. You have to get down there, and they have to trust you. And you have to be tough. And if they don't, don't, if the first article doesn't work, they got to pay for it. And if the certifications aren't right, they have to pay for it. You know, it's, it's one of those things. But I don't know whether I answered your question or not, but uh, leadership is very important. Like on the joint stars, I'll tell you quite honestly, Al Verderos and Marty Dandruff, that program was very close to termination because they weren't getting the airplane in the air. It took leadership and inspiration to hire the people, work with the subcontractors, and get that software into the air. That's what it took. That's a wonderful question. What is the effect of the mergers with Northrop? Actually, it was a very, very fine merger. Northrop uh, came in, uh, uh, Ollie Boylow, who some of you know, became the first president of Grumman, the Grumman portion of Northrop at the time. He was a tough guy, but very fair. And uh, what they did is they basically preserved all of the major elements of the company. Now, obviously, the company was coming down in size at the time, but the electronic warfare work, the airborne early warning work, the Joint Stars work were all preserved. Uh, they are where they are, and they're operating and making, mo making money. And some of the other areas, the advanced design work has been moved to other centers. But I was one of the people that came west with it, and I feel that it was a very good move. Uh, Obviously, it was good for the Grumman shareholders because the shareholder value was good. But I, I believe that Northrop's strategic plan of acquiring the best companies like TRW, Lytton, Westinghouse, and Grumman made Northrop one of the finer companies in the world. And I say that because I, I work for them, obviously, but, but I believe that. Question is, 
the German engineers. He was very interested in how Grumman got these people and other companies. What happened after World War II is the United States recognized that the German technology was years ahead of the United States. For example, remember the B-47 bomber and the F-86? That wing design was developed in German wind tunnels, basic data. Right? And of course, we modified it and retested it. So after the end of the war, there was a race on between the Americans and the Russians to take the best and the, best and the brightest and bring them to the United States. You know the story about Werner von Braun, et cetera. Well, what they did with the aircraft designers, they literally moved them to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, right? And they had to go through all of the screening, et cetera. And then they took a DC-3 and they flew it around the United States and they say, you get off here, you get off there, you get off there, you get off there. And that's how we got uh, Joseph Hubert and Dr. Um, Buchmann. He was from Blom and Voss, brilliant, brilliant aerodynamicist, and, and Joe Hubert. And they added tremendous capability to our company and they became citizens and they contributed. I hope that answers your question. There probably is, uh, I talk about it in my book, uh, about that a little bit, uh, and um, I can tell you one anecdote where we were uh, wrestling with something called the VSX, which became the S3. Grumman lost that proposal to Lockheed, and, and uh, I had the design team in charge of the doing all the trade-off studies to end up with the configure, what the configuration would be, and we were wrestling with the skin friction coefficient relating to the fuselage wetted area. John Wittenberry knows all about that. And we couldn't decide on it because we, we were worried about it. So I went up to Joe, I went in his office and he said, let me think about this. So he takes out a book from Germany and he goes down, he says, that's the skin friction coefficient, point oh oh three five. use that. That was it. <laughs> there was no arguing. Obviously there was a little bit, but, but that's basically what happened. Anything else? Okay, the question was CAS. What did Grumman do in CAS? Well, um, we obviously looked at that. We participated in the AX um, design studies. We lost that. Northrop built the A9, and uh, uh, obviously the A10 Thunderbolt is rather a remarkable airplane built by, built by Republic. The uh, A6 Intruder did have a close support mission, but at low altitude, it was very susceptible to gunfire and that took down some of those airplanes in Vietnam. Uh, but uh, when we, we actually took over the A-10 program from Republic, and many of the engineers came to us, and hence we got, we were very involved in the program. Uh, and uh, I hope it still continues. It's a very, very important program. Well, listen, this has been a great pleasure. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About here at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. I'm Betty Wheaton. I'll see you next time.